my drama. And because of the dog days of summer, that means the Potomac Theater Company is here with their reverse transcriptions plays. So what do we think about these dogged plays? Take it away, Mark. Potomac Theater Project is a group we've been following for many years, ever since the late great actress Jan Maxwell and Alex Draper were working with them. Now it's different people, but they're always fine performers. They're now doing a, a two different evenings. The one I saw was called Reverse Transcription, Hauntings from Pandemics Past and Present, and it's two plays. Dog Plays, written by Robert Chesley and directed by Jim Patosa, deals with San Francisco 1989 during the AIDS crisis. The main character, Dog, encounters three very different men. We get very deep into his feelings and into the state of living in an epidemic. And the most interesting for me was the middle one where he's with a guy named Fido there on Castro Street looking at the memorial photograph of a, a beautiful man who died. And um, Fido loved him as a distance while Dog was a roommate and a good friend of his, but never a lover. The second part, uh, very strange, written by Jonathan Adler and Jim Potosa, directed by Jim Potosa, features New Dog in New York City right about now in the COVID era. I didn't, it's a response to the first play. It also has three encounters, but I didn't find it as coherent or as interesting. And New Dog seems to be haunted by the ghost of old dog. Um, I liked the first play very much. I gave it a happy face. The second play, mixed space is minus. But always go to Potomac Theater Project. They always do interesting work. I just we should let you know there's another evening that Potomac is doing called Sex, Grift, and Death. So you have two occasions to go to see the Potomac Theater Company. Meanwhile, I am here to talk about one of my favorite subjects. Maybe I shouldn't say, well, it's legal now, so I can. Cannabis, a Viper Vaudeville, with music composed by Grace Galoo, libretto and co-direction by Bobby Israel, dramaturgy and co-direction by Calvin Wilkes, is an historical romp highlighting pot or cannabis through the ages not to mention the age of Aquarius. As a co-production between two of the best off-Broadway venues, La Mama and Here, this is a high-octane show with dazzling cake fry costumes, two Seattle lighting, Ace of Wimber sound, and David Bengay's groovy video design. It was like an old-fashioned happening with everyone dancing and cavorting with the cast and having a high old time. The musicians and actors were great mood enhancers and a good time was had by all, including yours truly. Happy face. Selena Fillinger's POTUS tells the untold stories of the various personalities propping up the fictitious highest ranking figurehead in American government. This presidency is meant to be so outrageous that it almost feels believable. It follows the strong-headed women such as chief of staff, press secretary, and first lady throughout an otherwise ordinary yet scandal-ridden day at the White House. It highlights the ambition and ill-fated efforts of those women. The White House is brilliantly brought to life through its turntable set and lighting, complete with the Oval Office, press briefing room, and bathroom. The turntable set allows the portrayal of an endless sense of hallways and offices, while also showcasing multiple scenes at the same time. The score of pop music is used to transition between scenes, empower certain characters, and playfully engage with the audience at curtain call. The all-female cast features big names, Vanessa Williams, Leah Delaria, Julianne Hugh, Lily Cooper, and Rachel Dratch, who all enthusiastically bring their characters to life. POTUS comes from a mostly female creative team and debuts the 27-year-old playwright Selena Fillinger's work on Broadway. POTUS is laugh out loud funny thanks to its slapstick humor, writing, and breaking of the fourth wall. It feels like a hybrid of an episode of Veep and an SNL sketch. It lives up to its name and delivers in being a farce. This limited engagement production takes place at the Schubert Theater through August 14. Happy Face Plus. Oh, I totally agree with this. I, I think it's called Julian Howe. She was in Dancing with the Stars. Who knew she was? She plays this hysterically ditzy blonde who really is a sharper tool than anyone thinks. And all the people, I mean, you have, 
a cavalcade of the brilliant comic and people in the world. It is so funny. But if you're a very bad prude and you can't stand a certain four letter word, this is not the show for you. Because it really, I was just on the floor hysterical laughing this whole thing. And, and, and especially with the politics being the way they are, this is like such an antidote against how evil politics has become. And it's nice to be able to laugh at it again. So I'm giving this a happy face plus two. And we caught up with Julie White at the Drama League Awards at Sardi's where Benjamin did the camera work. And so here is an interview with her now. Hi, I'm Julie White. Yes, and you are in POTUS, and what's the rest of it called? It's called Behind Every Great Dumbass Are Seven Women Trying to Keep Him Alive. But in this play, you have more than seven women keeping this play alive. Well, we do. We have exactly seven women. We call ourselves the Magnificent Seven. <laughs> it's Lily Cooper. That's on stage. Because oh, yeah, I was say, Susan Stroman's behind and stage. And off stage, we have the great Susan Stroman. Her assistants, which are both women, we kind of, we let Beowulf design our set, who is a man, but pretty much every other department head is uh, is a woman. Well, he's an honorary woman. Yeah, we made him an honorary girl. <laughs> so tell me, so let's talk about POTUS. I mean, that is just so much fun. You must love going to work. It is so funny. It's basically drama behind the White House. It is. It's like um, all great farces, you know, have the stakes are always really, very, very high. So everything is immediate and has to happen right now. And it starts out at like a nine and it goes to 14 or something. It's, uh, it's so fabulous. And it's such a great group. I mean, Lily Cooper and Leah Delaria, Rachel Dratch, um, Vanessa Williams, Susie Nakamura, Vanessa Williams, Julianne Huff, and myself. And we just, it's got the kind of the magic thing that happens every once in a while where there is no weak link. Everyone is so strong. And it's like, it's like, being on the Chicago Bulls in the 90s. You know, I just, it's so much fun to get out there and play ball with those women. They're so, so good. And it's so much fun to be in the audience to finally laugh. Oh, my God. Oh, we I'm get to laugh. I'm so glad you do. Yeah, it really does feel, Sue Stroman said, wow, I haven't heard this in many years where it feels like the Laughter is just falling over the, like a waterfall over the balconies and out into the theater. Like it's a crazy, it's a crazy kind of cathartic and good feeling. It fills up your, your tank a little bit when you get to have a great laugh like that. I think it kind of, we've done a lot of crying lately and sometimes you need to fill up the tank so you can get back out there and, and, um, do our best to make things better. <laughs> and who knew a four-letter word could elicit so much amusement? No, that was such a dirty word. The first thing I say in the play was so dirty when I was a kid. But, but now I'm saying it on Broadway. <laughs> and it's a really hard play to review because how do you get away without saying that word? Oh, how do you say any of it? But and now we have merch with it written on there. The thing that I, that Harriet says at the ending about the cunty dawn coming, <laughs> you can buy it. There's a cunty dawn coming cup or and then, shirt. And anyone who complains about the language, I say, well, that Shakespeare used that word all the time, but you, you just use it in different contexts. Okay, sure. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> I just don't think anybody complains that much about. There's some prudes out there. Then they shouldn't come to see this. No, they should. Yeah, but I... We don't want them there. But so far, we've had a lot of super fun audiences. James Ajami's Pulitzer Prize-winning Fat Ham transforms overdone Hamlet to a fresher and meatier plot. Tio and Juicy are getting the backyard all festive for a little party to celebrate Juicy's mom marrying his pap's brother. Coming over are their friends Ravi and her two kids, Opal and Larry. Juicy's dad, Pap, interrupts the decorating to get Juicy to avenge him. But why should Juicy? His dad was a mean SOB, as were all the generations in his family. 
he has inherited trauma. Besides, he hasn't a clue how to kill anyone. Opal, on the other hand, would have no trouble killing anyone. Characters are always being told how to be when they have other ideas how they would like to be, to be or not to be, right? This was just the cleverest, funniest play that I have seen in a long time. The way Mr. James takes the premise of Hamlet and skewers it like the pigs that Juicy's family slaughters and barbecues for a living is priceless. This is not your grandma's Hamlet. These people have minds of their own with any hidden agendas and secret longings and sur surprising paths. Will love be requited? Will revenge be carried out? Will Teo become a porn star? Is Shakespeare turning in his grave? And will he come back to haunt us and take his revenge on us for enjoying this Pulitzer surprise when he plays so much? Even reading the play made me chortle with glee all over again. Fat Ham is one delectable show, major happy face. Elevator Repair Service is doing The Seagull, Chekhov's play, which deals with um, the son of a famous actress who wants to be a writer and is considerably avant-garde and criticizes his mother and her lover, who's a famous writer's sort of conventional style. Now, this is sort of an interesting play for Elevator Repair Service to pick because they're an avant-garde group that has been around for many years. And this production is sort of, it gives us both the Chekhov play but also the avant-garde troops' reaction to it. At three hours, it's a bit long, but it's constantly exciting and it's new ways of doing different scenes in very different approaches. For me, the last act was the most accomplished and it really wowed me. All in all, I'm giving this a happy face. Viewer be warned, this review and show is not safe for audiences or workplace discussions. Every second Thursday of the month at the Slipper Room, Hotsy Totsy Burlesque presents a themed burlesque show with fan favorites like Star Trek, Doctor Who, and Stranger Things. A variety show complete with costume characters, strip teases, and choreographed dance numbers. It is perfectly entertaining for those who are fans of each theme and those unfamiliar with them. The performers enthusiastically entertain and tease audiences over the course of an hour and a half show. I attended Harry Potter and the Pasties of Fire, an annual celebration of Harry Potter. Featuring Harry Potter during his birthday in July as he reunites with characters from the series, we are introduced to an alternate sexual reality of events. Featuring characters such as Progressor McGonagall, Sirius Blacks, the Weasley Twins, Snape, and Draco. Audience members watch as Snape deep-throated a wand, hooked up with Harry Potter, and stripped down to a thong. The show is heavy with pasties and Wizarding World references, concluding with Harry Potter's Golden Snitch pasties. Only in New York will you find an event like this. Go if you're a lover of new experiences, fan fiction, cult classics, or want to get a reaction when you tell them where you're going. Happy Face Plus. For the first time in 58 years, Funny Girl is back on Broadway, currently starring Beanie Feldstein through the end of July. Fans of drama might be currently drawn to the casting decisions of this show, but those who are fans of musicals should stay for the score. <laughs> score is simply what carries the show, while the story I found to be rather underwhelming. Starring Beanie Feldstein, she did not quite get what she deserved, but she did deliver in being a funny girl. Reviewers were quite harsh on her, and it's understandable as some of the notes she could not carry. Uh, having seen both Beanie and Julie Benko in the role, there is certainly a starch contrast between the two. However, it's always going to be difficult to avoid the Streisand comparisons with this show. The show does, however, feel like a watered down version of its namesake, a cast of 22 being cut down from the original 43, while orchestrations are currently made up of 14 players cut down from its original 25. Even with the revision from Harvey Firestein, the story still feels rather underwhelming. I give this show a happy face minus. Fanny Bryce never stopped believing in herself. She was going to be the greatest star. Her mom's poker playing buddies weren't so sure because Fanny isn't pretty like a Miss Atlantic City. Fanny had Ed Ryan on her side who convinced the proprietor Tom Keeney to give her a chance at a solo scene turn. As luck would have it, and why wouldn't it with that reprobate gambler Nikki Arnstein showing up, 
to conclude some business with Tom and ending up giving Fanny the business. Fanny joins Zigfield as a headliner for the Follies and then falls for Nick, where they have a tempestuous relationship, which provides much of the drama. Now, I know we all think of the Barbara Streisand in it. And I mean, if you wanted to cast Fanny Bryce, you should have cast Kimberly Faye Greenberg, who's been doing a one person Fanny Bryce brilliantly for like ever. So, but I enjoyed this because I went in thinking, this is a backstage story like Hairspray with an unlikely person dreaming of hitting the big time and succeeding. Armed with this preconceived notion, I was able to enjoy it for what it was because the casting was just plain bizarre. No way Jane Lynch, who is beyond tall, could be Beanie Felton's mother, who is very tiny. But they are both such charming personas that I just went along with it. And there was much to be tickled by in Funny Girl. Jerry Grimes' exquisite tap dancing. And I saw the understudy Jeremy Gimes, who has matinee looks and a gorgeous voice. And Deborah Cardona and Tony DeBueno as Mrs. Bryce's ponies were great comic foils. I don't know why I had to be so overamplified, which spoiled my complete ability to appreciate watching this never before revival. You've got some impeccable timing. I mean, you get a, a great score. I mean, I liked it. So I, it's a good backstage story. So I gave it a happy face, Mike. And I should mention that Sasha Clark saw it with me and I've got what she has to say on Facebook. I recently saw at the Gene Frankel Theater the theatrical version of The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance written by Jethro Compton based on the short story by Dorothy M. Johnson. And if you love the great John Ford film, you'll be familiar with it, but it's also quite different. It starts at the um, funeral of Burt Barakin, who's now a forgotten man, and flashes back 20 or 25 years to the arrival in town of Ransom Foster, who came from New York and went out west with a law book and some textbooks, Greek and Latin and Shakespeare, to civilize the West. He's the spirit of civilization and the new, uh, while he comes in conflict with the opposite of him, Liberty Balance, the outlaw, who's the embodiment of the old Wild West at its worst, total savagery, anti-civilization. These two men will come into conflict and we know it's going to end badly from the title for Liberty Balance, because after all, he's the one that was surpassed by history. There's also a love interest who owns the saloon, Hallie, that both the um, Forgotten Man and uh, Ransom love. And it also deals with political change. It's a very wonderful play with a really great confrontation scene between civilization and lawlessness. And the actor who plays um, Liberty Valance, uh, Derek Jack Charriton, only has two scenes, but he steals them magnificently, even though everyone else is good. This is a really fun play. Happy face, go see it. The Rose Room is the newest addition to the New York nightlife scene, aiming to create an intimate experience through its speakeasy circus atmosphere at the Producers Club. The room is small with the feel of an artist's green room converted to a performance stage. It is outfitted with several couches, a DJ, and illuminated through a neon rose light. The Rose Room offers bottle service and two time seatings from Tuesday through Saturday at 9 p.m. and 11 p.m. The first act is a variety show, each night offering a mix of comedians, musicians, singers, and other novelty acts, while the second act is a bit more not safe for work consisting of acrobatics and dancers. The diversity in its lineup creates an air of mystery and fun escape. The Rose Room makes for a unique date night activity. The acts are interactive and every show brings something different. The night that I attended consisted of part magic show, part dirty trivia. The magician was playful, freeing himself from a set of ropes he was tied up in, while the trivia was insightful and competitive. Through my participation in the show, I learned how many nerve endings are in the clitoris from trivia, it's 8,000, and directed the magician to slam his hand down on a sharp object while avoiding injury during his act. Reservations are required. Tickets are available on Today Ticks, Fever Up, and the Rose Room NYC.com. I give this show a happy face minus. I was a little underwhelmed, but I appreciated the experience they created. 
and I went to a press conference of the first time Cat on a Hot Tin Roof by Tennessee Williams has been done off Broadway. And I've got interviews with Maggie the Cat, Big Mama, Big Daddy, and Rick himself, and some scenes, and whatever doesn't show up on this show will show up on our next show, August 13th. Oh, here we are with... Matthew Regattis. And you are doing... Uh, playing Brick and Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. And it's off Broadway. I had no idea that they never got to do it off Broadway before. That's shocking to me. Yes, we are the first ones. Yeah, we we will trailblaze the off Broadway path from here on with Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. So uh, it's very exciting. And I bet Brick, because every actor has a role, and the Brick is like in the canon of I want to play this part. Brick is in certainly for someone in, in you know in my age range. Brick would definitely be uh, you know a top five or ten role that you would definitely want to play for sure. Uh, and in, in the pantheon of theater, I would definitely say, regardless of age range, he's certainly one of the top roles that any any actor would would, would want to play for sure. Because you get Tennessee Williams language and an extremely complex character because you are you are hiding from your truth. You know who you are, but you can't let anyone else know who you are. Well, I, what do you mean by uh, what do you mean by uh, who I am and uh, who I don't know? Are you referring to brick sexuality? Exactly. So I don't always necessarily think that it's so obvious that the character is gay or that he's not gay. I think there's a lot of other things going on behind the scenes with Brick. I think a lot of people just assume that he had this uh, homosexual relationship with Skipper. But I think that uh, it's almost like the play doubt. It's like, well, is he or isn't he? I, I don't think it's so cut and dry, and I think it's it's better to leave a little air of mystery as to what really happened in that relationship and that's kind of the way that I'm interpreting the character and how I'm playing I mean I know as as Matt what the truth is but I don't know that it'll come out so obvious to the to the audience in the performance so that's good because that makes more sense because Brick is very obviously confused he loved his friend but there's this hidden thing that he doesn't understand what it is so that makes sense to me yeah, you know, uh, we were doing uh, a, f a few interviews earlier, and I and I, I got asked a similar question. This is a very dysfunctional family. Uh, he comes from a narcissistic household. Coming from a mother and father like that is going to screw a guy up. So regardless of his sexuality, whether he is straight or whether he is gay, Brick is going to be dealing with a lot of other personal issues coming from a family that raised him in such a toxic environment. I mean, when you see the play, I'm sure you know it, um, especially our version, this is a very dysfunctional family. So growing up in a dysfunctional family, take sexuality out of the out of the equation. This guy would be drinking anyway, living in this family. And also you're dealing with loss. And in the time of COVID, we've all dealt with loss. So it's how someone deals with loss too, which usually gets lost in the wayside. Well, I think it's he's definitely dealing with loss. But I also think what is interesting and something that sort of gets glossed over in the play is that his wife, Maggie, slept with his friend Skipper. So it's like Maggie's not innocent in this. So Brick's anger towards Maggie isn't because he's not attracted to her or because he doesn't want to sleep with her. It's because, you know, obviously he's got a lot of things going on right now that is screwing him up emotionally, but he's not happy about the affair, you know, as any man I don't think would be. So that's an element of the play that always seems to just get totally glossed over that she had an affair with his best friend. And I think a lot of the animosity that Brick feels towards her is that it's not because I'm not attracted to you because I'm a gay man it's because look what you you did this to to me you slept with my friend you 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 played him to try to figure out what was going on between us and and that's not okay so I think that's a huge element of the play that uh, we're exploring in, in, in this show that Maggie's not this you know innocent woman in this play at all I never thought of it as innocent. I thought of more of it as a survivor. Well, a survivor, but she also definitely does some messed up things, I think. And sleeping with Brick's best friend, Skipper, definitely does not make her, uh, you know, the, in my opinion, uh, out of the gate, the, the hero of, of the play. And I think all of that is part of what Brick is dealing with. I mean, he's dealing with his friend's loss. He's dealing with... The, the, the whole sexuality thing. He's dealing with this, this narcissistic family. He's dealing with his father's death that he just found out. He's dealing with Maggie sleeping with his best friend. So there's, there's a lot going on with this guy. It's not just one thing. Well, 
I can't wait to see it because Tennessee Williams is my favorite playwright, and thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. He's my favorite playwright, too. So him, him and Shakespeare, definitely the, the two best, in my, in my opinion. Uh, I'll go with DeRay for comedy. Okay, okay, that's cool. Well, thanks so much for your time. Thank you, too. Do you know what happened to her? Do you know what happened to poor little Susie McPhee? Oh, what happened to poor little Susie McPhee? Somebody spit tobacco juice in her face. Oh, somebody spit tobacco juice in her face. That's right. So, old drunk, we have the window of the hotel gate, so, and yell, hey, queen, hey, hey, no, queenie. Susie looked up, flashed him a radiant smile, and he shot out his squirt into back of his right at Wilson's face. Well, what do you know about that? What do I know about it? I was there. I saw him. Must have been kind of funny. Susie didn't think so. And he stared screen like a magic. They had to stop the parade and remove him from a throne and block him. So next show is going to be August 13th. I'm sure we'll have lots to talk about. We'll have more on Cat on a Hot Tin Roof and a review this time and some more from the press conference and a lot of stuff, which I'm sure I've forgotten right now because, you know, you're seeing someone who has COVID. So that's how it goes. It's difficult. Thank you, Errol, for coming. Bye-bye. Great to see you. Bye.